Hello and welcome back. Um, I know those of you who are listening know, especially those of you who've been on this journey for a while, uh, know that I will often uh, tell you how excited I am about today's conversation. Um, but I'm going to do it again. Sorry, I'm going to do it again. Um, I am beyond excited is probably true to word because today uh, I have the, the most remarkable woman, Lizzie Williamson, joining me today. And uh, why I'm so excited it for, is for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, we've uh, we first met over nine years ago uh, when both of us were on a journey to really step out into the world and you know make a, a have a big impact on the things that we are deeply passionate about, which we're going to talk more about. Um, but also be, um, because of the work that she's mostly doing. So over the years, we've done a lot of different things together. Uh, you know, spoken at events and seen each other in passing at events. Um, but the the thing that we're going to talk about today is something that's very close to my heart and obviously very close to to Lizzie's um, is the book that she's got coming out in uh, I think the public launch is on the 30th of January but we'll get more into that in the podcast and it's called the active workday advantage now the the book fundamentally well look what can i say it is so rich number one so as soon as it comes out you need to make sure you get yourself a copy um but what we're going to be talking about today and i'm going to paraphrase some stuff that i read in her book called T turning the word um exercise into energize um and and making it so goddamn simple that you actually there, there are no excuses and look there's so many ways that i could introduce lizzie because she's just done so much and is so incredible written books been on tv um has got this global movement called two minute moves um but we're just going to get stuck straight into it and and the phrase that i would say that once you know lizzie's been dubbed the ex what is it the excuse exercise buster excuse buster from down under and I think that's so great because how many of us, I mean, myself included, how many of us know we need to do more movement? We know we need to exercise. We know we need to take better care of our health. And yet life is so, it can be so stressful. There are times when in your darkest moments, and I dare say, I know we've all been there, where it can feel really tough just to get yourself out of bed. And, I, and I'm certainly not stepping over that. And even in the face of that, Lizzie Williamson has managed to create a movement that helps people, no matter what you're dealing with, actually get yourself started. So, Lizzie, I, like I said, I'm so thrilled to have you here. I, I just love you. I'm, I'm a raving, you know, despite having met, you know, met nine years ago, I've been a raving bloody follower on Instagram to keep watching you for my own little bits of inspiration. But thanks for being here and congrats on the latest book. Oh, thank you. Just having a little happy dance here for those of you who can't see me. I'm so, I am just as excited to be here as you are. So thank you. Yeah. So why don't we, um, I, I really want to get straight into the, the new release of this book. And honestly, uh, it's been one of those, I, I've been reading it in the bath. I'm <laughs> reading out the backyard. I'm like, it is is so rich full of content so why don't you actually just give us in a nutshell firstly to start what is it about and why have you written it there was this day that my teenage daughter came home from school and she was in this really really bad mood and I just remember she just washed in through the door and slammed it behind her and she put a school bag on the ground and she was so annoyed. Now, it's not an unusual thing to see um, my youngest teenage daughter a little bit annoyed and cranky, but this time I was like, whoa, she's got something to say. And she stood there and she said to me, Mum, why is it that we have to sit and sit and sit for hours all day at school? We're all falling asleep. My back's killing me. We can't so stay focused. Why does it have to be this way? I remember looking at her going, oh my goodness, isn't it crazy that what she's describing is what so many of our work days look like. And I just thought, I need this workplace to look different when she goes into the workforce. I don't want her to be, you know, sitting there stuck in this, you know, no breaks at school and then go and do the same thing at university and school. And, and it just really put a fire under me to make a book that was going to actually have an impact in some way. Mm 
because for a long time I have been talking about getting get, helping people get moving how you're going to do it do a lot of talks and and sometimes you do those talks and and share that message or do that video and you think is anyone actually going to do it is there ever going to be any change i know a lot of people just like watching my videos which is good because it makes them feel good and smile and everything and and laugh when i'm you know there uh lifting up my water bottles and using them as weights and things like that the water and bottles I just, all the, the oh, no, i know i know i just cut you off then but one of the things that i have to go back to and this is going back many years back when you not just the water bottles but i remember once i think did was it true there was wine bottles as well like yes this, there was a oh, whole was section like, of wine yeah. bottle workouts in my first book two minute mood oh moon. my god <laughs> I, was so, I, was, I was just struck then by that that visual so sorry yeah <laughs> so. that's right and so i really wanted to create this book as something that people go okay that's that's exactly what i can do here's a roadmap of how i can do this as an individual and then beyond that how can i do this and be a role model for those around me whether that's on virtual meetings whether i'm in the office how can i actually create and join this movement literally of an active work day and that's the book that i really set out to to write and in amongst that i really also wanted to revisit what I looked at at my first book in Two Minute Moves, which really stemmed from this time in my life where this teenage daughter of mine was a baby and I had a toddler, so 15 years ago, and I couldn't get myself to exercise anymore. It just felt way too hard. I couldn't believe it. Before then, if anyone I knew had was suffering with their mental health or depression or anything, I just think, why aren't they exercising? It's going to make them feel so much better. Come on, just go exercise. What's wrong? And of course, when I was in that place, I found it absolutely impossible. So the things that I learned from there, these change of mindsets, these little simple actionable steps that I took from there and then went on to then work with organizations around the world, helping them do the same. That's what I wanted to, to put in the book as well, because it's not easy, like you say, mm. it's, there's a lot of things that get in our way. So mm. how can we in a real tangible, actionable way, bust through them, and know exactly what it is to do. We hear all the time, sit less, move more. But yeah, what, what do you mean? And so that's, um, that's all those reasons where, why I wrote that book and really wanted to exactly what you want to do, Kylie, make this impact in my own way. Mm, love it. In fact, I know in the book you do, you do bring up the, the say do gap right uh and and because we do know especially in this industry there uh it's a billions and billions of dollar book industry uh all, all really pointing to the same thing you know we we all fundamentally know that we need what we need to do uh and then we don't we don't uh and, and sometimes we do uh and then we get on a move and we etc right so i do want to talk a little bit about that specifically right um because we could say well here's another book that's got the great like really full of extraordinary and i say extraordinary lizzie because I think what's remarkable about what you've done is that you it's like you've done the extra mile of thinking for people. So whatever the, the obstacle, there is a solution inside of that, whether it's a physical move or a breath move or a mindset move, which is remarkable. So, you know, yes, all the all the juicy stuff about what there is to be doing is inside the book, uh, which we'll be putting the links in the show notes for. Um, but I want to talk about this say do gap, right? There is the, the the things that get in the way and given that you brought up um you know that this did start from you on from the basis called a time when you really did struggle um i want to talk about that because at the moment what we are trying to do is, is let's there's many different people we're shifting but let's say we're trying to shift firstly the people really who are like it just seems impossible let's just talk about that for a moment because what what are you how do we really get over some of that whatever's in the way and what are some of the obstacles that you've heard that it, that get in the way the big obstacles the number one reason that australians give and i imagine it's all around the world is i don't have the time second is i can't get motivated and then it goes on from there i'm too tired i'm too embarrassed i hate exercise all of those things the number one thing the first thing we need to do is actually reimagine this whole 
exercise thing because so many of us have all these rules around what exercise and a whole lot of other self-care, meditation, whatever, has to look like. We think, of course, well, exercise, for example, has to be this certain amount of time. If we're going to go to the gym, it has to be for an hour. If we're going to go for a walk, it has to be 30 minutes, it has to be this certain location, wearing certain clothes, special equipment, all these rules that we have set up. And of course, there is a multi-billion dollar fitness industry telling us how we should be exercising as, as well. And so what so often happens, this happened to me and with so many people I speak to, if it can't look that certain way that we always think it looks like for us, if we can't walk out the door um, whenever we want to, maybe we've got sick kids, it's raining, we're too tired, we've got too much work to do. Uh, if we can't find that hour or that 30 minutes, then what do we do? Nothing. That's right. <laughs> so, nothing. That's exactly right. <laughs> Oh. It's the all or nothing mindset. And I realized at that time when I had those little babies and I couldn't, it just exercise, it just felt impossible for me. I realized I had such a wake up call that I was so stuck in that all or nothing mindset. And so mm. many of us are. Mm. Yeah, 100%. So, okay, so given that's the case, if you're shifting from all or nothing to all or something, uh, you got it. Yeah. Oh, I love that part too. So much I love. <laughs> uh, so if we're going to say, okay, folks, great, there's your shift. So let's say now I'm going to shift to something. Uh, what would you say would be some of the ways to then practically take it from to something? Like how small, how, how long? Where do you start? You start so small that you think, really i mean whenever i used to say you know two minutes people go two minutes come on what is two minutes going to do so that's a big roadblock to overcome this idea of these small little things actually don't count they don't matter so the idea is you start really small and then what will happen is that you'll start seeing over time that those little moments do start to add up those 20 push-ups that you do each day against your wall in when you're having a hard moment at work there's 20 push-ups at the end of the week you've done 100 push-ups so i would say to start super small and you think that okay we need to break up uh each hour we need to do some movement just start with one time in your day attach it to something that you're already doing for example, if you're there in your day and you have a sip of water, that's a moment we go, okay, I'm going to commit to doing 10 squats after every time I do a sip of water. When I'm waiting for a virtual meeting to start, that's a moment I'm just going to stand on up, stretch my arms up for a moment and sit back down. If I'm on the phone and I can, that's when I'm just going to stand on up and do a few little raises up and down of my heels. Because what happens is that when we don't move very much, our body stops craving it. It doesn't need it. You feel it. If you don't go for a walk after, uh, you know, if it's been, say, a whole week and you haven't gone, then you start to not really miss it as much. Whereas when you do it one day and then the next and the next, it leads to that momentum and you start to really crave it and, and want it more. Even if that is just a two minute moment, a 10 second moment. And so when you have that little voice in your head that says to you, whatever that thing is for you, I don't have the time, I can't be bothered, I've got no energy, you want to say back to that voice, just do two minutes, just do five seconds, whatever that thing that feels achievable for you, just do that. And then you have to come to that trust that that little moment is that little step that then leads to the next to the next towards that where you're wanting to go that person that you're wanting to be that impact that you are wanting to make in the world it's those little moments that that lead you forward and take you there well if i didn't have my uh, camera light set up the way that i have at the moment i'd be doing it right now because here i am with you and those, uh, those of you who are just listening obviously can't see us uh, but but if you can see us um you'll see that lizzie's actually walk in the talk she's standing while she's recording this i on the other hand am sitting on my ass and i'm, I'm immediately going mm, yeah the thing i could do right now is actually just get, stand myself up uh so no take oh, can i just can i add in something there it's yeah. not just about the standing it's about movement so let me take you through this 
You're right. sitting there, Kylie, right? Imagine that you have dropped some pens on the ground there. So mm. just lean on over and try and pick one up. You don't have to go all the way. Pick one up, then come on up, pull into your tummy muscles, then pick one, the other one up the other side. Yep. And do that two more times. So in this little moment, you have moved your spine out of that same stuck position it's been in. Okay, now take a little look behind you, like someone's called out to you. And then the other side, turn around, one more each side there. See how you are moving your spine that gets so inflexible. And no matter where you're listening to this, raise one arm up now, stretch it up, one arm, stretch up. And then the other arm there, up, reaching high. And one more time, this time, start to imagine what it is you are reaching for as you do it. Reach up, what do you want today, the rest of this year, next year? Reach up the other side, take a big breath in, and then bring it back down. So there's actually so much that you can do on your chair. No one would even really know you're doing it. If you look side to side, if you lean over, if you look behind you, the idea is movement, giving your body the little chance to get out of that stuck position, which leads to all sorts of ergonomic injuries, pain, and things that we just really get in our way of doing what we want to do. Oh, that's so great. Two things. Number one, the fact that you did that pen thing, I do remember I was like, when I saw that the book, I went, that is so gold. I could see being in an actual meeting in a boardroom with people, you know, like going down and pretending to pick up the pens. But just doing it then for myself, I, I've actually surprised, like the last couple of days I've been doing some extra like um, foam roller stretching because I've been noticing that I've got extra tightness in this right side of my hip. Anyway, when you just did that thing, I went, oh my goodness, that's actually helping me <laughs> release that one. <laughs> Great, I'll start doing that now on a bit more regular basis. Um, but the second one, uh, uh, the the ability to just do that, like you're saying, so, so, so simple. Um, and I think that was the other thing I really loved about the way that you've written the book um, is the ability to be able to see ways that you can do it no matter what, what obstacles and like clearly I wouldn't have potentially said oh, well that was an obstacle caught I in my head I had it that the only option then or the option was to stand up but suddenly you've given a list of other alternatives and I think that was the other thing I I think is just extraordinary about it um so I want to ask you um something that you do also bring up in the book um I am a raving fan, yes, folks, but as a researcher, I also love the, the fact that you just brought in so many different things that, you know, I mean, we've been probably inundated in the in the world with lots of research about health and stats and all the rest of it, and we know the benefits, but there's two in particular, and I'm, I'm going to read the two out because it depends on what you're looking for, I suppose, as a listener uh, and, and what appeals to you, but I, I want to bring this up because you've brought up, you know, a couple of studies, uh, and then you've given given an analogy about how this is akin to being a Formula One driver, which I'd like you to share with us. Um, but so the two, two stats that I, I read that were like, wow, uh, was one that was done by a Colombian university that revealed just one minute of walking after 30 minutes of sitting led to significant decreases in fatigue and significant improvements in mood. Mate, if I don't know what doesn't shift anyone in this world to now walk a minute every 30 minutes, oh, seriously, I'm like, yep, lift in mood, deep fatigue for sure. Um, and then and the you second... can do that walk on the spot. Right. Oh, what do you mean? I mean, if you can't get outside for a walk, stand up and do that walk on the spot. Really? Even when you're on the phone. Right. Pace it around, walk around. If you're in your office, walk around the office walk around my kitchen, uh, my kids will start wondering kitchen, what yeah. the heck I'm doing. <laughs> I'm always walking on the spot. That's so great. That's so great. Um, and then the second study, I was like, this fascinated me. Um, so there was a study that uh, was on uh, lifting weights, that if you lift weights for as little as three seconds a day can actually positively impact muscle strengths. I'm like, what? Serious? So cool. And the coolest thing is that study has been, I mean, that just blew up around the world. That's Edith Cohen University right here in Australia. That's they're doing so much research about these small little moments of, of movement there. So I love that that comes from from us, that one. 
Yeah. Now tell me this story about Formula One driving, because when I read that, I was like, I like, I mean, number one, I just laugh. Like, I do love moving fast and I'm actually being coached at the moment to not move so fast. Uh, but I loved the analogy that you give. Can you share that with us? Yes. So if you have been watching Drive to Survive on Netflix, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I never thought in a million years I would get into Formula One car racing driving. But there is this fabulous show when you get to know all the drivers and all of a sudden you're really invested in them all. And we're sitting down for two hours watching cars going round and round and round a track. I can't believe it, but it's happening. So I've been watching this show and I'm just thinking about these drivers are high, high performers. They're just incredible. And there they are racing towards the finish line. And it's just a matter of milliseconds. It's crazy. But then something, you know, there's, it's strategic to get there. They've got this crew and the crew says to them, box, box, and they need to change their tires for optimal tires. They need to maybe have something done to their engine. Maybe they've had a knock or something, whatever. They go in and they have this quick pit stop. Sometimes it lasts for a matter of seconds. Then they get back on the road. And I was looking at those drivers thinking, the last thing they might must want to do is box box and go into the pit and stop. They must just want to keep driving and driving, I would imagine, because that's how we are in our work days, where they're seeing, they're going, come, I'll just finish this one, I'll just finish this thing, I'll just finish this thing. And the idea of taking breaks or taking little moments for our bodies, our brains, our self-care, really feels like such a such an interruption and maybe we don't even remember to do it there's there's no cues or anything that we've set up that's telling us to do that which we need to set up and so i feel like we're so like these drivers powering towards finish like your audience here kylie we were all so ambitious so so passionate so wanting to make a, an impact and people like us those little pit stops can be so hard to do but your vehicle this is a car. Our vehicle is our body, our brain, our spirit. And we think we can just drive it, drive it, drive it and not take those pit stops. Uh, but you only have to look at, I mean, Australia's got the, the highest rates of burnout in the world. What's happening to our stress levels, mental health, even our bodies to know that this way of working is not working. And we can take a whole lot of inspiration from those super high performers that are those Formula One drivers and take our own little pit stops in the day and they will help us perform better. Mm, love that. So great. So um, I now want to jump to another part that you've talked about in the book, another one that resonates a lot, especially when we talk about um, when I'm looking at leadership and development specifically, is this myth of motivation. Uh, and, you know, we often hear a lot like when we're talking with leaders about the focus that they put on needing to motivate employees. And I'm like, Look, motivate, motivation is a myth. You, you, you cannot actually, you can't motivate somebody else. They struggle little motivating themselves, let alone you thinking you can do it. But I noticed you brought this up in the book and, and specifically that, you know, the, the, that it's action that actually precedes motivation, not the other way around. So can you share with us a bit about this, this theory and what are you saying specifically about motivation and action? I really... This really became quite a strong thing in my life, actually, after I had experienced postnatal depression, so that 15 years ago, and you know, my motivation, it really felt at rock bottom. And, you know, getting over those things isn't a quick fix. It takes time. And also there's lapses. There's times, as we would all know, that we start to be feeling good and then we start to feel not so good anymore. And our motivation feels like it's just completely left us. And what I started to realize at that time was that the less motivated I was, it was like this signal to myself that, whoa, you really actually need to take action here. This is the time where you need to do something the most rather than here's all my motivation, I'm going to do it. This motivation, this lack of it was this real cue going, whoa, this, this big sign. I'm feeling so unmotivated, I've got to take some action. And that's when I started to realize it's the action that, that precedes motivation. If I want to feel more motivated to do something, I have to start building up in that action um, because that's what's going to help me, one, 
feel better, two, build that momentum, and three, get the, that, the results that make me want to do it again. And so I'm always seeing that as a sign to myself. Even now, oh, I can't be bothered you know, going out for a walk. I don't want to um, do my push-ups at the kitchen bench. I can't be bothered doing some, um, some squats here at my desk or even in the mornings. I just oh, I don't want to say three things I'm grateful for. Whoa, okay. How come you are here not wanting to take care of yourself, not wanting to do the things that are going to make you feel better, not doing the things that are going to help you feel stronger, switch on your brain more, do the work better that you're wanting to do. Okay, there's something off here. Let's go down for those squats. Okay, now I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, there's so many things. There's so many things that we don't want to do in our day. Sometimes we don't even want to get up out of bed. Sometimes we don't want to send off that email to someone. We don't want to make that phone call, but we do it anyway. Mm. And the same just has to go with exercise and movement and self-care. It's all right if you don't want to do it. You've got to do it anyway. Mm, it's so great. In fact, there is a, um, I'll call it a quote because it's pretty much written in your book. Um, not only, I, I think the part that I really loved about the back end of that message was that you said that this mindset then spills over into other domains, which empowers us to tackle challenges, pursue goals and make positive changes. And I think that's a really extraordinary thing to be draw bringing into this because often um you know we're especially when we're dealing with a lot of different challenges in life you know you've got your family or you've got work and you've got finances and often that feeling of just complete fatigue is because it all just occurs too much but i think what you're saying here like it just the focusing on one area if you can just pick exercise as one area and you start taking that action it does. I, I mean, it's the very thing that I keep saying, you know, people work with me, right, in the area of leadership development, right? But what do you think I get them to start with? The very first thing I look at is what is their resilience score, right? And inside that score, it tells me what specifically are the areas of their health and well-being that are under threat. And health and movement and exercise and sleep and composure and meditation are all part of it, right? So rather than first get them started on the actions they need to take in their area of work, I show them this result. They're like, well, what do you think is the one thing? Because, you know, 90% of human beings are not in the level of resilient. And I, I, I know also I think that the category of languishing. Uh, where like 50% of the population are actually in the category of not succeeding or having any progress towards their goals, right? Which is a lot of people. So it, it is a massive thing to be able to not just get that into exercise, but empower you in all other areas of life, which I think is a really important place to start. Absolutely. So I, you know, we feel strong when you work on your strength, for example, you feel stronger. And imagine if you're about to, you know, hop on a, a virtual meeting and you need to present something or it's, you're going to have to have some bit hard conversations and all of this stuff is there in your body. We, it's all stuck there. We hold on to it. And then you go in with that, all this tension, tightness, stress. And now imagine a different scenario before you go into this meeting, say you put your hands on up and you start having a little bit of a box out in front of you, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a shadow punch. Maybe you have a little quick jog on, this, on the spot to get all your oxygen and blood flowing and release that serotonin to help counteract cortisol. Maybe you do some push-ups against the, the wall before you start. Or maybe even you just stand there and get connected with your feet in the floor, take your shoulders back a little bit and change the state of your body. Mm. And how that changes your state of mind and the difference then that, that how you then relate to other people, how other people perceive you. And that's just through a simple moment of movement, of changing mm. the way that you're, you're, what's in your body, what's stuck in your body and, um, and how you're holding your body. Oh, so great. Um, so there's one more part because, oh gosh, we could just talk forever. But there is one more thing before we get off that I do want to ask you about. And that's this part that you talk about resistance and shifting perspectives. And I really loved the way that you said something like um, uh, that resistance is actually a clue uh, that we're actually on the right track. 
That was just really, I've actually, just to be, like, I've actually really used that ever since starting reading your book. I'm like noticing where I've had resistance, not re just, to, not towards the exercise, but other things in life. And I went, oh, remember, this is a good thing. This is an indication that we're on the right track, which I found really useful. So can you share with us a little about your views here about resistance and, and, and why you're saying it's a clue? <laughs> Well, I, I, I quoted Stephen Pressfield because this is, I got this from him. He's written this fabulous book called The, the War of Art. And he talks about this idea of when you're wanting to create something of meaning, do something a bit bigger than the, the norm, you're going to get all this resistance. It's a bit like self-sabotage. Don't you feel that, you know, you, when you decide that you, you know, you want to get fit and healthy, there's often something there that's, that's, in, that's in the way of, of doing it, or you'll just start, you know, having just so much chocolate every, every night and, uh, and it's just all, you're self-sabotaging those goals. That's, that's me, for, that's the example I'm giving. And so this idea of going, okay, I am wanting to create something really great here. And maybe that is just, you know, changing the, the way that I um, work, bringing in more movement so that I can think better and so I can feel better. And it's just incredible. The moment you make that decision, the amount of resistance that will come in. And resistance can look like all the washing that you could be doing instead. Resistance could look like scrolling through Instagram for the next half an hour. And when you start to, to see it and notice it, you'll see there's so much resistance put in, put in your way. And so it's just that moment I like to always just, give, I give my resistance a, a name, you know, Mr. Resistance. And I say, all right, Mr. Resistance, I see what we're trying to do here. You're trying to stop me from doing this thing because you think I'm putting myself out there. I'm doing something that's going to, um, you know, make myself better in some kind of way, help myself be my best self. I see what you're doing. I see you're worried. And, um, and that's okay because like I quote in, in the book as well, the Elizabeth Gill bit about fear you know how she talks about you got to put that in the passenger seat put your resistance in the the passenger seat but there is something amazing like you say when you start to recognize it and see it you go whoa why am i holding myself back why in this moment i thought I, my alarm goes off to do some some little stretches or moves and i ignore it why am I doing that? Why am I resisting what's actually going to make me feel better? And sometimes that awareness can be such a, a wake up call. And uh, so then when you start, you know, rather than doing some, some moves, you get on social media and you're, oh, okay, that's resistance. Put the social media down. Let's actually undo the thing that is going to, to help me get where I want to go. Oh, awesome. So it wouldn't be, it would be a bit of a miss if we actually didn't do something practical, although we've, you've got me to do that a little bit earlier. Um, but given that we are really talking to a group of people who, you know, in the workplace today, we know, and certainly I know from the Emerging Leaders Program that I ran recently, one of the biggest challenges that people often, that cause a lot of stress uh, and tension is the concern about having to have a difficult conversation with a colleague at work, you know, and so the, the, the body immediately triggers, um, you feel, you know, really tight about it, but immediately everyone's stressed about it, right? Even calling it a difficult conversation is the thing that I try to tell people is that, well, actually, even if you call it that, it's going to set off a whole series of stress. So to close off today, um, I was actually going to ask you if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing with us uh, one of what you call a brain boosting activity, breathing activity that you recommend uh, when people have to deal with something like going into having a difficult conversation. And then what we'll do is um, everybody else will, for once we complete today, we're just going to throw in the show notes and links for you to recommend. So could you guide us on what, what is the one thing we should be doing right now? Absolutely. Well, I would be doing what the military use and firefighters use in those high pressure situations where you start to go, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do at all. What to do? How do I cope with this situation? And your brain goes all crazy. And they do something called tactical breathing or box breathing. And the idea is you breathe in for the count of four, like you're doing the first line up of the box. You hold that breath for the count of four along the top line of the box. Take a breath out for the count of four down the bottom line of the box and hold that breath out to close the box up. So 
The great thing about this, if you're listening to this and you're in the car or you are walking or you're doing the cleaning of the house, whatever you're doing, you don't have to go and sit in Lotus Pose in a cupboard and close your eyes. You can do this right here, right now. Don't close your eyes, especially if you're driving. So you breathe in for the count of four. Hold that breath for the count of four. Breathe out for the count of four. Feel your jaw and your shoulders soften and melt and hold that breath out for the count of four. Let's do it again. Breathe in. Hold that breath in. Breathe out and soften and hold that breath out. So your nervous system is going, oh, maybe everything's okay. Maybe I'm not going to be, um, to die. Maybe I'm not going to be chased after that by that saber tooth tiger anymore. And this just, just that moment to take that micro breather, sometimes you realize, wow, it's been a long time since I've had a nice long breath. And it's been a really nice time, a long time since I've taken this tiny little moment just to try and quiet and soften. You focus on that number, the square, the breath, whatever you can do to help bring you back to the present moment. And another little thing that you could do definitely in that situation is the idea of just rolling your shoulders back a few times as well, holding your body in this open stance, taking your hands by your side, turning your palms to the front. So if you're sitting there, you can do it. If you're comfortable enough, you can raise them up a bit more to the side there. Just open up. It's, it's a little bit like, I've only just thought of this, it's a bit like that Titanic moment. So it's opening up to what's, what's ahead because you'll find in those moments, you're gonna contract down, down, down. So the rolling back of the shoulders, even the reaching both arms up to the ceiling, taking that breath there and then coming on down there. It's just really a little moment to pause, isn't it? So great. I, oh, so, so great. And there is so much more available in your book. Um, a, a extraordinary amount, uh, even talking about purpose uh, and brain boosting and mindset and breathing, a whole raft of things. So Lizzie, I think the best thing we can do now is let's give a plug for your book and the URL where people can go get themselves a copy. Well, it's on pre-order until January the 30th. And as leaders and people doing stuff and business people, sometimes there's things that you're doing that are important. And apparently pre-orders for books are important. So if you're interested in getting this book, then a huge thank you to you if you pre-order on Amazon or Booktopia. And if you head to my website, lizziewilliamson.com, you'll find all the links there as, as well. And, uh, and let me know if you have done a little pre-order, send me a little message and I'll, I'll send you a little special thank you. Oh, definitely pre-order. Oh, definitely, definitely pre-order and definitely head to the website. One of the remarkable things with Lizzie is her generosity and all through the book, uh, she does reference the material that she has sitting on her website that is incredibly practical in your ability to do that. So make sure you get yourself started. Don't wait till January 30s to start taking it, to start moving, start moving now. Go to lizziewilliamson.com. And Lizzie, thank you again for joining me today. It's been so fabulous to see you and talk with you. I am just bursting. I think I'm going to have to go turn on a song and have a dance now. <laughs> Girl, it's amazing, exciting energy out sitting here in front of you to knowing all that you do all that you give to the world we are all so lucky to have you kylie you are such an incredible person i feel so so lucky to have had this conversation with you so thank you oh thank you